All right, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, orchestrating security policies today, and uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. You might be in your office, working away, making firewall changes, and things may seem monotonous, but in fact, they're not. So, you know, we're going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about containers. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to just talk about containers, but uh, I will use containers as an example for something that happened several years ago and uh, had a dramatic impact. And we think that something of that nature is happening right now in IT. So let's go back in time to 1960. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of what happened in 1960. Around 1960, the container was first introduced uh, in shipping, and it was first introduced in New York City. And at the time, you know, five years later, less than 5% of cargo going between the United States and Europe was used in containers. But in a mere 10 years, the vast majority of cargo was now, um, now traveling containers. And containers were a dramatic difference to what happened before. So beforehand, in 1960 and before, you had a whole industry of longshoremen, people that would take you know, the cargo, unload it, get it back on. Shipping things via cargo was very expensive, very slow, and very inefficient. A lot of cargo got lost or stolen. Um, it was just not very effective. Uh, and the container changed all that. So the introduction of containers had a disruptive impact on that industry, and it had a massive global impact as well. So entire industries were wiped out. A lot of people lost their jobs, had to find new jobs. Uh, whole economies were transformed. So New York City had a major decline as a port, and a lot of other cities had declines. Other cities that were digging deep sea ports were suddenly, uh, you know, became a lot more prominent. And you saw a rise in trucking as a result of that. So with the advent of, uh, of the containers, it was possible to do cargo shipping dramatically cheaper, faster, and much more efficiently than it was before. And it simply had a huge impact. If you think about um, you know, all of the international trade that occurred from, let's say, 1970 onwards, international trade exploded, that wouldn't have been possible without containers. And you can literally trace it back to that invention. And you know, this might not be relevant right now to your networks, but we believe that there are disruptions happening right now in IT. And those disruptions have the exact same needs around them. Efficiency, cost, and agility. All right, so let's talk about modern IT. And there's three elements I want to talk about. I want to talk about virtualization. I'm going to talk about cloud. And we're going to talk about software-defined networking. And these are the three elements that are happening or have happened recently. Uh, in the industry, and they make up what we call modern IT and everything that has to do with networking. And one of the key questions is, will it actually be more secure or less secure in the future? So let's look at virtualization first. So you used to have you know, operating systems and physical servers, and then came the advent of virtualization. So you had you know, VMware, KVM, Zen, and you had an abstraction layer you know, between the physical layer and the logical layer, and that enabled decoupling. From a security perspective, that decoupling, we believe, actually helped a lot because instead of managing the various platform differences, you could focus on the actual security controls. Software-defined networks are also interesting, something that's happening recently. If you think about it, the internet was designed for resilience, right? What would happen if the Russians dropped the bomb? A distributed architecture, kind of like BGP. And in many ways, enterprises adopted that for the wide, wide area network. So the wide area network works with the same routing protocols like the internet, right? But 25 years later, you look at what's happening in large enterprises and telcos now, and it's a huge mess. It's a vastly distributed architecture that is very complex, very difficult to manage. And the idea is, okay, let's try to centralize all of that and have it working in concert. And that's what SDN is trying to do. So SDN is multiple things to different people. It is also an attempt to maybe reduce the dominance of Cisco in the network world with having you know, cheap kind of off-the-shelf servers with a controller that are software-defined and you can no longer, you don't have to rely on one vendor. And on the other hand, it's the ability to manage the network 
through software, right, through APIs. Cloud is another huge disruption. So how did the cloud start? And you all know this. It started as servers connected to the internet. You know, web servers with remote procedure call. You can do all sorts of things through APIs. And with virtualization, advanced APIs, you could control computing resources remotely, right? So you could start managing not just one web server, but multiple machines, right? And today, the cloud, in many ways, provides IT as a resource. So it's kind of like a utility. Uh, at least that's what the vendors would like you to have. Uh, you turn it on, you turn it off, you pay as you go, and you use as many resources as you need. You don't just buy resources and have them sit around uh, doing nothing. So until recently, cloud was just a bunch of networks on, you know, a bunch of compute machines on one LAN, right? So you had, maybe you had a gateway protecting that uh, network, but essentially within that network, there was very little segmentation or access control. And recently, some of the leading cloud platforms adopted the SDN concept of a centralized network, right? So now you have what, what's called SDDT, the Software Defined Data Center. And there's essentially a distributed network running on the cloud hypervisor with virtual routers, virtual switches, and virtual firewalls mimicking the actual physical network. So here are some of the leading cloud providers. So you've got public cloud like AWS, Azure, Google, and others. Cheap, available, scalable, but you know, not owned by you versus the private cloud like VMware, NSX, OpenStack, Cisco ACI, where you own it, you control it, it's flexible, but it's much more expensive. A lot of organizations are actually using a mesh of the two, which is the hybrid cloud. So what are some of the security challenges in the cloud from an access control perspective? Right, so most of you are managing physical on-premise networks, and a lot of times, in most organizations that I've seen, the cloud is actually managed by app and server teams. Right, you don't get to actually manage that infrastructure. They've built it, they do their dev and test on that, and a lot of times they do production as well. And those people are not necessarily focused on security, right? And it's different also in the on-prem world, if you're talking about your Checkpoint, Cisco, Juniper, Palo Alto, whatever you're using, uh, you know, it takes some time to implement a change. Somebody makes a request, you look at it, you do risk analysis, you do design, you implement the change. In the cloud, they make changes on the fly within minutes, and they make tons of changes, and yet there's very little visibility or control over network segmentation, right? So, the common theme in the cloud, from your perspective, what we're seeing our customers, is how can you roll out a mission-critical app into the cloud if you don't have visibility or control over the security posture in the cloud? Now, the cloud, from our perspective, presents not just security challenges, but also security opportunities. So, and I think you've all heard this a lot in the past few days and in the past couple of years. You will be breached, right? It's not a question of whether you'll be breached. It's, you know, when and where. It's not like it used to be where you just felt that, you know, uh, everything will work fine, it won't work fine. You will be breached. And when you're breached, the perimeter will be breached in some way, and you need to control east-west traffic in some way. So in cloud terms, essentially, when somebody penetrates a machine, whether it's a laptop or a web server, they're onto that machine, the next thing they're gonna do is start looking for that database that's got 20 million credit cards. Well, if you, don't, if you have lax security controls, within your LAN, then through east-west traffic, the hacker can get from one machine to another, right? So there's essentially three approaches to access control within the data center. There's ACLs on switches managed by something like a NAC, relatively reactive, difficult to manage, host-based firewalls, and if you have thousands of firewalls, that is literally impossible to manage in one place. And there's what's called micro-segmentation without cloud hypervisors. So if you have a cloud data center, you literally have a hypervisor that has a distributed firewall that can manage all of that at the same time. So from our perspective, the cloud micro-segmentation approach is the most scalable, manageable way of managing east-west traffic within the data center. And it's interesting, and it's kind of a paradox, cloud data centers actually can be more secure than on-premise data centers because they are programmable and you can control every aspect. It's kind of like, it's not intuitive. It's like uh, you know, people are afraid of flying, but you know, flying in an airplane is probably safer than uh, being on the highway. Uh, in a similar way, a cloud data center can be more secure than a physical data center. Uh, and it's through the abstraction of platform differences, right? When you're in a cloud platform, you don't care what is actually happening, what are the physical servers. 
you have an API, you have a certain layer that you're controlling and you focus on the security controls within that layer, and you have centralized access control within the hypervisor. So let's look a few years in the future and let's assume right now that all of the data centers of the future will be cloud. And I think that's actually true. Five years from now, the vast majority of data centers will be cloud data centers, whether they're public or private cloud. But the perimeter will always be physical, right? You always have offices you'll need to connect to an ISP. You'll have boxes out there. So even if the, your entire data center, all the data centers you have are all cloud, and maybe it's the same cloud, the network will always be heterogeneous and complex because you will always have perimeter machines as well. You'll have all sorts of switches and perimeter machines. So uh, you will never get rid, rid of the fully heterogeneous network. So I think what we're moving towards is a multi-vendor, multi-technology heterogeneous IT. Physical networks, which will stay forever, virtual data centers, and public clouds. So in the physical data center, how do we do security and access control today? We use subnets and zones, like you know in your favorite firewall brand. Um, in a virtual data center, you can do micro-segmentation, use the hypervisor firewall to separate different VMs and control access between those VMs. And in the public cloud, you've got security groups, similar concept, just a little bit different. So how can we take advantage of some of these IT disruptions to actually improve security in our organization? So first of all, we'll talk about central security management. We'll talk about automation. And I'll talk about abstraction. And from our perspective, these three, three tenants are what make up modern security. So let's start with central security management. So IT in general is becoming even more heterogeneous, right? You've got traditional networks. What we call traditional is physical on-premise networks. You've got public cloud. You've got private cloud, software-defined data center. We have to control network security across all these platforms. I don't think it's valid to let the server and app guys assume control over the cloud environments. It will always come back to you, and if it doesn't come back to you, then that team will own that, and when the data center is 100% cloud, then you know, you'll have a lot less influence from that perspective. Abstraction is also important, so multi-vendor is kind of a fact, because you'll have a cloud provider, you'll have all sorts of firewalls, you'll have routers and switches inside. There will be no standard across all platforms, so all these platforms are different, and they do things in different ways, and you have to abstract the complexities, right? So there's all sorts of different technologies, different ways to route things, different GUIs, uh, you know, a lot of different environments. And the way to abstract them from our perspective is to actually look at connectivity from the application perspective, right? The business runs on top of network applications, and the business thinks in terms of applications. And if you're thinking firewall rules and you're not seeing, you know, the applications that are des you know, those rules deliver, then you're not looking at the right picture. The right picture is to start with the applications first and see all the connections required for those apps to function and how those translate to actual rules on your firewalls, routers, and switches. All right, automation is another thing that we can use to, to improve. So from our perspective, automation is if you need to log in, you failed, right? At least that, that's what we believe. And you know, if you look at manual change implementation, a lot of you guys have either doing this now or have done this earlier in your career. Right? So from our perspective, this is slow, error-prone, and not scalable. But it looks cool. You can impress your friends. You know, maybe think you're a hacker or going away at that console. But uh, in reality, you can make a lot of mistakes this way, and it's not really scalable. So the Tufin vision is to enable large customers to implement network changes in minutes instead of days with better security and better accuracy through automation analytics. Right, so how do we go about doing that? This is the Tufin orchestration suite, and I'm gonna take a few minutes to explain the various components, and then I'll show you a couple of demos that we've recorded. So at the top, you see the, the enterprise applications. The applications that we're talking about are your custom apps. We're not talking about email or you know, DNS or anything like that, although those are apps as well. Think about the apps that your business is developing internally, supply chain management, everything that makes your factories run, whatever your business is, whether it's finance or, or uh, operations, you have apps internally that are custom developed for you. And those apps require a lot of network changes. And at the bottom, you see the network infrastructure 
that delivers those apps. And what Tufin does, Tufin is the middleware that enables you to implement the network changes required for those apps to function on the infrastructure very quickly, efficiently, and securely. So how do we do, go about doing that? We've got um, an abstraction layer that abstracts all the different types of firewalls, routers, switches, cloud platforms, and we're connected to all these devices all the time. So we know who made what change and when. And the next thing that we build in our abstraction layer is a topology model of how all those pieces interconnect, right? So we take into account things like MPLS, VPN, NAT, all sorts of complex network technologies, and you can query that. If you want to tell how to go from point A to point B, we'll actually build that graph for you and show you what that will look like in the network. Uh, at the top, we have the application connectivity layer, and that's where we discover what your apps look like from a connectivity perspective, right? So we discover the apps, and you have a model of how, ev how, of how every app is connected you know, throughout. You know, it's not just one firewall or one router or one cloud platform. You're looking at an app. It's got connections required for the app to function, and those connections might be spread on multiple devices, but you can see it on one place in Secure App, one of our products. From a security and compliance perspective, we have two components. You can build your unified security policy within Tufin. So essentially, you can take the policy that your security architects or your CISO defined, right? So segmentation policy, how different networks should connect to each other and which networks should never connect to each other. You can build that in, in our tool, and from that moment on, we will monitor every change that occurs and tell you whether you broke any compliance with that policy. We also look at um, regulations like PCI, uh, SOX, NERC, and we can tell whether any change that you're about to make will violate any of those controls. So in the automation piece, you know how I said that we can make a change in minutes instead of days? Here's how we do it. You start with a high-level change that is required by the application owner. So the application owner might use a high-level template. He might drag and drop a web server and say, this is what I need. I want to connect to this web server. He doesn't necessarily need to know all of the intricacies. He doesn't need to know that it's, you know, which ports are open, et cetera. Network engineers can define that as a template and say, in this app, if you drag and drop a web server, it's going to be port 80, port 443, and port 22 from a certain network. The application owner doesn't need to know these details. He just adds that web server in, clicks next, and it opens a ticket. And within that ticket, we now know the networking elements, right? So we know the source, we know the destination, we know the port number. Tufin then runs automated risk analysis of what will be the impact if you implement that change, right? So we know what the connection looks like. We've got source, destination, port. We know what is the policy of the organization from a zone perspective, right? What should never be done on any network in the organization, which, let's say, insecure networks should never connect to a secure network. If that request of connection violates that policy, we can flag it immediately. And essentially, you can avoid making a mistake and having a configuration error go out to production. So it's simulation enabling you to stop a mistake from happening in the first place. So let's assume you've passed risk analysis and everything's fine. The next phase is network change design, right? Which firewalls, routers, and switches do I need to touch? Here we use our topology model to, to simulate it. And we can tell, let's say you want to go from point A to point B, we will literally build the graph for you of all the nodes along the path that you need to touch. So it might be firewall A, firewall B, router C, router D. And we might even be able to tell that firewall A is a checkpoint, firewall B may be another brand, router C is you know, a Cisco router, router D is a Juniper. We will build a cookbook of how each of those needs to be changed, right? So part of you know, our intellectual property and the things that we do is under the, understanding the logic of every single network device out there. So if we need to implement this change on the checkpoint, we know which rules need to be added and exactly in what order. And if it needs to be an ACL on a Cisco router, we know how to do that as well. So we build a cookbook about how to implement that change, and you can click a button and we will literally push that change out for you. So you can see how we've automated the change design, risk analysis, the network design, and the implementation. That's how essentially we can go from something that literally takes days to something that takes minutes. All right, so I want to show you couple of videos. So one of the first one is about abstraction. So this is what your network looks like. You've got a virtual data center. You've got a physical data center. And you want to go from one point to another. And the question is, how do you go about doing that? Right? So you have a, one server that wants to connect to another server, one network that wants to connect to a server. And you're kind of scratching your head. This is what, maybe what you do every day. 
trying to figure it out, pulling out Visio diagrams. Uh, this is our GUI, this is our topology model. And essentially you can search this topology model kind of like um, Google Maps for networks. So I searched for my checkpoint firewall and I found it right here. I can click on it, see all the networks that are connected to it. So these are the networks that are behind this checkpoint firewall. And here's a specific network. I selected that for my source network. I'm gonna type in a destination IP address. And I wanna see what is the path in the network going from that network to that server, right? So I'm gonna find the paths. And essentially, we're gonna automatically show you the path within the network, right? So this is the graph that you will traverse based on MPLS, NAT, VPN, all sorts of technologies that make a packet hop from one place to another. We have that within our network topology simulation. Right, so let's look at the path itself and see whether that path is possible today. You see in the checkpoint, the checkpoint is marked as red. That means the checkpoint firewall is blocking that traffic right now. Right, if I click on the checkpoint firewall, I can actually see some of the routing information. Um, so I see the next hop, which interface goes out to the next hop. I can see more details in this network topology map. Um, so for example, this is hide NAT uh, on this network specifically. And the next one, you can see there's NSX. So it's checkpoint going in essentially to, a, to an NSX. And I can see that on the checkpoint, there's a drop rule number 26. This is what is blocking this connection from actually happening, right? I can also do that, you know, look at the NSX firewall. This is NSX essentially is a VMware distributed firewall. And I can see all sorts of network properties in there. Next video we have is central security management. So this is the Tufin GUI, right? This is the, the main dashboard. You can see all the devices on the left side. You can see risks per firewall, and you can see the recent changes, right? So if we dive into one of these, we can start looking at uh, what's actually happening and whether you're compliant or not. So here's how you can define a unified security policy between different zones. So we're gonna click on this, and it's gonna open up this matrix of all of the zones that you've defined against all the other zones. So each cell here has a definition. Here, I've limited traffic from these two, between these two zones to specific ports. And here, I'm limiting to no rules with any, no it has to be logged and there has to be a comment. This, for example, is very useful if you wanna comply with PCR or NERC, right? So I have, these, I have this policy, this matrix of what should never be done or how I expect connectivity to work. Um, we also have some pre-CAN reports in this case, it's the PCI DSS report, which I ran. And I can take a look here and see that all the rules that are violating a specific portion. So here, I think it's 1.1.6b. You see these three checkpoint rules at the top? Those three are violating that specific P PCI requirement. So you can go back and fix it, right? So automated CAN reports of various types. You can also drill down and look at all of the violations from a specific machine or a specific area. So here you can see, uh, in this case, it's NSX, and you can see two separate critical violations of my policy, right? So you can look at per device or within a framework. Right? Here's a cool thing that we've added recently. This is an R15.1. It's a Google-like search of all of your rule bases across all your firewalls. So here I'm searching by ticket ID. So I'm gonna find this rule that had a ticket ID, and you can see on the right side, you get this checkpoint rule on the right side, you got all this metadata. Last hit, violations, you know, technical owner, ticket ID, all sorts of things that are relevant. And I can drill down and see which policies this specific rule is violating, right? And I can search through using all sorts of mechanisms. I can search for shadowing, uh, you know, business owner, technical owner, all sorts of metadata, including items in the rule itself. In this case, I'm gonna search for shadowed rules, you know, rules that are completely shadowed by other rules. In this case, it's a bunch of rules on a Cisco ASA. And this makes sense, because in Cisco, I don't know if you know, but they don't warn you if you have shadowing, and Checkpoint, Checkpoint is smart enough to do that. But in Cisco, you might have thousands of rules that are shadowed by other rules. So this is a really nice way to find all those shadow rules very quickly. You can also kind of run a search on all rules. So here's all the rules on various machines. So you got the AWS firewall, this is a checkpoint firewall. Here's the NSX firewall. All right, so very cool rule browser and Google-like search, not just into the rule bases themselves, 
but into the metadata of the rule documentation that we've kept for you. All right, let's look at automation now, some of the things that I described earlier. Uh, this is Secure App. Uh, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see, but it's a list of all the apps that I have defined, so it's kind of a small environment in this case. Um, and you see the status of each one. We're gonna jump in and focus on one specific uh, application, which is the CRM, right? And right now it's empty. I'm gonna add the first connection for that app. So I'm literally dragging and dropping components. I'm gonna drag a couple of servers to the, uh, one server on the source, a couple of servers on the destination. I'm gonna also drag and drop a, a port in there. Search for it first, drag and drop. And essentially, what I want to do here is automate that connection. This is, I'm an app developer or I'm an network engineer who wants to implement this connection right now. And I'm going to run this through my workflow. The first thing I'm going to see is whether this has any risks associated with it. So I'm going to run risk analysis. Right? And, and also, I see here that I need to actually implement a change here. So you can see a firewall rule that is blocking this traffic. If this traffic wasn't blocked, maybe I wouldn't need to make a firewall change. But yes, there is a firewall rule that we identify that is blocking this traffic, so yes, I do need to make a change. Here I'm actually running the security compliance that I just talked about. So we're compliant, no violations, I can go ahead. And when I'm going to implement this ticket, this ticket will go through the full automation cycle that I described and will literally be implemented in a minute. So in this case, I chose the fully automated workflow option. I'm gonna click on next. And from this point forward, it's gonna open this ticket. And as soon as submit is clicked, it's gonna go through. So this ticket has no risks associated with it. And I'm gonna show you in a moment that we actually skipped several steps in the workflow in order to achieve this automation based on specific conditions. So let's now go back and actually see what this looked like. All right, so let's look at the implementation first. And we can see that it's implemented, right? So in the time that you saw the video scroll, actually it, was, it went out, it got implemented, and we saw that change through Secure Trek. Let's look at the workflow that got us to do this. So we have here business approval, which in this case has a skip condition. So based on a certain network condition, we can actually skip this approval step and go right to implementation. And that's essentially the only way that you can get very fast automations by skipping various steps. Here we're doing risk analysis and designer. The designer is where we pick the various firewalls, routers, and switches that you need to implement changes on, and we design the changes that need to be implemented on, the, on each platform specific for that platform. So in this case, I needed to make changes on Checkpoint and on Cisco. If I open up the Checkpoint, you can see that we don't always suggest to add a rule. Sometimes it's enough to create an object and add it to a rule. Sometimes we add a rule. And in Cisco, for example, we will see actual commands that we will add to that Cisco ASA. Right, so these are the commands that will run in console when Tufin connects and implements that change. So now let's go back to SecureTrack, our monitoring and auditing tool. It picked up the change. Let's look at the change on the checkpoint firewall. We can compare two revisions and actually see exactly what happens. So we can see the side-by-side -side comparison. The rule here in green at the bottom is the new rule that was added and provisioned automatically by Tufin after risk analysis. And you can see right above it the original rule design the way it appeared in Secure App. All right, so what is security policy orchestration all about and how do we achieve it? So step one, gain visibility across heterogeneous environments, right? You need to control policies on all platforms, right? Physical, on-prem, public cloud, virtualized, any environment that you have, you need to take your high-level policy and enforce it across the, in the entire infrastructure. It doesn't make sense to just control on-prem or cloud or do them separately. You need to have one place to control the policy on all of them together. Step two is centralize the management, right? You need to enforce a unified security policy across all the platforms with their specific capabilities. So for example, if you have VMware NSX, it's got micro-segmentation and OpenStack as well. AWS has security groups. Traditional network firewalls have subnets and zones. Each one has its own way to control things, and you need one platform to abstract that for you so that you can worry about you know, the main security controls without actually worrying about all these things. So automating management of network security policies, 
start to apply automation, not just to IT, but also to security. So you, you want to be hands-free but preserve control. So remember that in, that in that instance where I showed you the full automation, there was a point there when somebody ran risk analysis and saw that there was no risk. So I'm not saying just automate everything, push out a change at will without any regard to security. You need to first build your policies. You need, be, ma you need to make sure they're sound. And only if your policies are sound, you can then run automated risk analysis, automated change provisioning based on that. So in summary, the world of network security is changing, changing very quickly. Disruptions are happening probably faster than you think. Cloud platforms, they enable agility and flexibility, but also increase complexity because you're not gonna just move wholesale to the cloud and leave your physical on-premise environment. So what can you do about it? First, I think you need to really accept the fact that the world is multi-vendor, heterogeneous, multi-technology. And remember the three magic words? Security policy orchestration. And one more thing, Tufin is integrated with R80. So if any of you are interested to see what we're doing for R80, we have a demo right outside. Thank you very much.